Welcome to this week's episode of Tech Talk, a very special episode of Tech Talk. I'm your host, Michael Amorgan, and with us this week, we have a guest by the name of Greg Wood. He is the CEO of GIBC Digital. Uh, Greg, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I was at Bridgewater Associates, which is one of the most successful hedge funds in the world uh, until 2011. I left Bridgewater to begin uh, the work and uh, start the company GIBC Digital. We did a lot of regulatory change in the er early days related to Dodd-Frank in the U.S. Since then, we've grown to uh, almost 70 employees. We have offices in New York, Boston, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, and uh, Freeport, Grand Bahama. I am uh, a graduate of the University of Virginia, where I studied philosophy. Uh, I also uh, have a degree in law, J uh, JD, from Cornell Law School, and an LLM in International and Comparative Law, also from Cornell, and a, an M MBA from Cornell as well. I have uh, four children, and I'm married. <laughs> That's a that's a very impressive uh, set of degrees that you have. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your company? Like, what does your company provide? And maybe give us a little detail on each thing in kind of like a way like a sixth grader can understand. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, we uh, have five competencies: data intelligence process design and automation, customer experience, cybersecurity, and regulatory and compliance. And what we do is we combine those to, to help businesses compete in a digital world. And every modern organization today has a few things in common, people, processes, data, IT systems, risks, regulatory requirements, and users or customers. Uh, so what we do is uh, we look at each of those areas and understand where there are gaps or areas to imp improve. And we really look at them not in isolation, but together. And then we apply our competencies to, to those areas and uh, help them do what they do better. Hmm. Okay. So if I could break it down a little bit more, I mean, uh, we, we really uh, focus on helping clients eliminate waste, reduce cost, lower risk by re-engineering and automating processes. Uh, we help them use their data to make better, more informed decisions faster to take advantage of opportunities and create a better user experience that will increase the lifetime value of each customer. Uh, we can also help them avoid the reputational damage that comes from failing to meet regulatory obligations or from, from corruption. And I think these are the pillars of every successful organization in the modern world. I would tend to agree with you. And I think a lot of people would be interested to see what you really, especially with that last point with corruption, especially here yes. in the Bahamas, this, that's going to generate a lot of interest, I guess you could say. Yeah, I, I think that's right. We just hired a machine learning and artificial intelligence expert. And he truly is an expert with uh, about 25 years of industry experience. Um, in, in cyber and fraud, and also in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And machines are, are much better at recognizing patterns than humans are. So once a computer has the right set of data, they can start to identify things that indicate fraudulent or corrupt activity uh, in, in a much better way than humans can. So this is really at the, at the cutting edge of uh, preventing uh, bad behavior. It's uh, no longer the case where you have to wait until it happens and catch someone. There are uh, enough uh, fingerprints, if you will, electronic fingerprints that uh, we can do a much better job preventing some of these things before they happen. I know that's definitely going to be in the interest of a lot of companies. Um, but I do have to ask, um, and I, you mentioned, uh, I don't want to get his name wrong, so I, I'm not going to pronounce it. Um, but Dr. Yogesh, uh, I, I don't want to mess up his last name. Yes, Dr. Yogesh Malhotra. Yes. Um, that's the gentleman that I believe you just mentioned about um, becoming the head for AI over here in Ground That's Pro. right. Yeah. Now, the news reports that your company plans to invest a minimum of 
2.5 million this year to establish that office in Grand Bahama. Can you tell us a little bit about that office? Yeah, so we're already off to a good start. We've hired 25 people and we will probably hire about 10 more this this week and next week and have plans to hire 50 in total before the end of the year. What we're doing is is training people as what we call digital f facilitators. And uh, we've already uh, put the first group through uh, the second phase of our training program and they will be ready to deploy uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's just the beginning of uh, where, where we plan to go, but uh, that forms the foundation of uh, a group of people who will have an understanding of how to do process improvement and automation and they are just uh, starting to learn uh, about cyber and, and how we think about cyber and things that we can do in that space. It's going to take a little bit of time before they are uh, true experts but what we do is we have people who come in to support them who are uh, subject matter experts like Dr. Malhotra and uh, that allows us to to go into organizations and get the work done that needs to be done. And I, I, I try to avoid saying that we're consultants because we don't just provide strategy. We uh, we actually provide strategy and uh, deliver change within organizations. Okay. Um, when do you guys fully expect, well, when do you expect to be fully operational? Uh, I, in two weeks, we will be ready to begin work. Uh, here in the Bahamas and regionally. So we we can provide uh, all of those services that I mentioned and we will support temporarily from the US and from Europe as, as needed. And uh, over the next few months, and as we uh, as we scale up, we expect the uh, the team of Bahamians to begin to take over and uh, at some point, and I'm not sure exactly when that will be, it may take six to 12 months, it will be 100% uh, Bahamian. Okay, that's that's very good. Um, I know a lot of people would, were kind of concerned, you know, a company coming in and the, the level of Bahamians to uh, foreigners, that kind of thing. Right. So the fact that you guys are going almost, I think you said, fully Bahamian? Yes. Yeah. So at the foundation of my philosophy, it's uh, we need local people doing local work. Every every market is unique, and no one has local relationships like local people, and no one understands the customs and uh, the, the, some of the details that make successful client relationships as well as local people do. So uh, philosophically, I think it's, it's important to uh, equip local people to do that and we, we've taken an intentional approach, uh, having been founded in New York, and that's uh, currently our lar largest market. Uh, as, as we step back and look at the world and want to have a big of an impact as possible, uh, we've taken an approach to focus on second and third tier markets that may be underserved. And it's, uh, it's a strategy that's beginning to pay off for us. We, we think that the real opportunity is uh, to come into these markets and uh, to train the people that will be uh, the supply to existing demand. And it's, it's, uh, it's challenging even in the large cities like New York and London to find the people with the skill set we need to do the work we do. So uh, strategically, we've taken a different approach and, and uh, believe that we have one of the best training programs in the market. Awesome. So how did you first become interested in setting up business in the Bahamas? Uh, I was coming here on, on holiday each year at Christmas and uh, enjoyed uh, the time in the Bahamas and getting to know the Bahamians. And uh, over time, I uh, realized that uh, with the change of administrations, that uh, there may be an opportunity to come in. And uh, with a new administration, they had new objectives and wanted to achieve some things that we thought we could help them do. So uh, through uh, a friend, uh, ended up setting up a meeting with the, the prime minister and uh, some of his advisors and had a conversation about what we might be able to do in the Bahamas. And it's kind of uh, just grown organically from that. Awesome. So how would you explain 
I guess you could say the marriage between GIBC and the Bahamas. And I know like in all marriages, there's kind of like a little give and take. What's what's your take on it? Like, uh, sorry, what the the give and take between GIBC and the Bahamas? Like what what do you see like with the marriage between both? Yes, uh, I, I think where we stand right now, I think the government is very motivated to uh, look for ways to create jobs. And one of the best ways to do that is through investment. And that's how we've come into the Bahamas uh, by making an investment. And uh, the, the relationship we have right now with uh, the Port Authority um, and, and the uh, Minutes administration, it's been very helpful. I mean, they've been very supportive and encouraging. And uh, we have wanted to come in quickly and uh, get things set up and start hiring people so that we can begin doing the work that there, there is to do here and, and regionally. So, uh, of course, there, there are challenges. Uh, getting, getting supplies onto an island is always uh, interesting and sometimes difficult. But uh, those are the things that uh, you, you face. And uh, certainly the, the uh, benefits outweigh the cost in my mind. Okay. Now, you had mentioned with the new government coming in and you working closely with the Minnesota administration and whatnot, I do have to ask, what role did the Commercial Enterprise Act in Grand Bahama play in your interest in the Bahamas, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one thing it did is, is overall it uh, demonstrated a government willing to create uh, an atmosphere that uh, was business friendly. So, you know, it's not one particular provision of the act, but it's the overall tone that the act set uh, in, in attracting us uh, into the region. Okay. So, I know in Grand Bahama, they are working to make the Bahama, well, Grand Bahamas a tech hub. What's, on, what's your take on the possibility of advancing the digital economy in Grand Bahama? I think uh, a few things need to be done uh, to to really bring that about. I think you need to, over time, attract additional employers. Uh, but you also need to have people here who have the skills to do the jobs uh, that would uh, make companies want to come here. So perhaps it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, one of the things I think you could do is uh, uh, potentially make... Uh, immigration here a bit easier so that uh, people could get residency and you could bring people in who have the background, attract companies, and then uh, start to to grow the uh, the number of people who are employed in the tech sector in that way. That's just one possibility, but I think it's probably a, a, a good way to get things going. It's certainly an interesting way. Uh, the other way is uh, to continue. Yeah, the other way is to continue to educate people so that over the longer term you have... Uh, Bahamians who uh, get technology and they are prepared to take on the roles that uh, these companies would, uh, would would have. Now, you mentioned uh, essentially the knowledge base and going over your website a little bit earlier this week and last week and whatnot, um, I didn't notice that there was a portion inside there that essentially dealt with training people. Uh, is that something that, so is it, you're creating a set Oh, sorry. A place where people can go to be trained on stuff as well with technology or what, it, what exactly is with that? Yeah, it's one of the things we're going to be doing in Grand Bahama. So uh, we we have uh, a great training program that we put people through so that they have a common core uh, understanding of the things that we do and how we do them. And we we want to be able to share that with the rest of the world. So one of the things that we've committed to do in Grand Bahama is build a training center uh, in addition to the data and AI center. So we, we think that we can attract uh, people from around the globe to, uh, to do the training. And as part of this, uh, this center, uh, we have in mind uh, not, not just a training center, but it's going to include world-class retail space, restaurants, office space, apartments and condos, uh, entertainment pavilion, a hotel and a medical center so that, uh, you know, to, to get and attract people uh, 
who, who you'd want to come in and, and uh, take training, uh, you have to have the, the world-class amenities that they would expect. And I think uh, to attract and retain top talent, you need those same amenities. So correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying essentially that you guys would be developing those things as well? Exactly. Gamma? Yes, exactly. And, and that would be something we would do in partnership with uh, with others uh, who have experience and, and uh, expertise in those areas. But it's something that we think is uh, is crucial to our overall success uh, in in Grand Bahama. I would <laughs> I would be hesitant to go against that. And not only that, but also say that that's something I think a lot of Grand Bahamians would also like to have, period. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think, uh, you know, what, what I have in mind is a place where uh, like-minded people with a common interest in innovation can come together and collaborate and create uh, new products and service, services for the digital com economy. Uh, you know, something that's uh, inspiring and uses uh, cutting edge technologies and its development and uh, is, is uh, sustainable. And, you know, one example would be to uh, have power derived 100% from sun and wind. I know that's a big uh, <laughs> debate going on about that right up and now, especially with how the power structure is done across the Bahamas on a whole. Um, a lot of people are starting to look at solar, but then there's the cost and then there's wind and water. Um, so if something can actually be done and a headway made, I think that'd be great to be quite honest. Yeah. And you know, there's some very innovative things going on. One of the things that, uh, I've, I've become aware of recently is, uh, one of the big tech companies is actually submerging its servers uh, underwater to keep them cool and they have eliminated the need to cool servers which as you're probably aware is one of the big costs uh, related to, uh, to to setting up a, a cloud network I think they're doing that in California if I'm correct yeah I, that's right yeah that that was an interesting concept especially y you wouldn't really think to put servers underneath the water to keep them cool well because they're servers Exactly. It's almost counterintuitive, but uh, <laughs> what, a, what a creative way to uh, eliminate uh, the, the primary driver of cost related to that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if there are innovative ways like that, and I think that's what you were saying, that you're hoping for this training center to become, or at least the amenities around the training center, as well as everything else um, with that you guys are offering, I think that would definitely be something that people enjoy. Exactly. And I, you know, I think the economic impact over time can be quite significant and far in excess of, of what we contribute in terms of uh, dollars. Uh, I, th I think the real benefit comes from the other uh, jobs that are created as, as we go forward. So we've estimated that three jobs will be created for every tech job that we create. Uh, and I think that probably vastly understates uh, as we start to look at some of these projects that we are envisioning, I think that vastly understates the number of jobs that will be created. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea is that if you can get some momentum going, uh, nothing creates momentum like momentum. So uh, I, I think uh, the future is bright for Grand Bahama if uh, government and business continues to work together and you get buy-in from the people. Uh, I, I think uh, there, there's a lot of potential upside. That's why we are here as investors. So. Do you see any other ways as to how your company would play in becoming a part of this tech hub? I, I think uh, there's a real opportunity for entrepreneurs here uh, to uh, play a role in providing services to businesses that are here and uh, maybe more importantly, businesses that come into the market. Uh, and, and so I could see us uh, actively participating with some of those uh, those businesses uh, uh, in, in perhaps a, a private equity uh, way. Uh, I also see um, opportunities for people who are entrepreneurial and uh, really get technology to come in and start to create products and services that we can help them introduce to the global marketplace. Okay. Now, on the flip side, what obstacles do you envision in actually getting these things to roll out? <laughs> I think to get the momentum, you, you have to do some things differently and whether it's uh, loosening up 
uh, re requirements to work uh, in, in Grand Bahama or something else, I think it's going to require uh, a lot of sustained and uh, focused effort on the part of the government to really get things kickstarted. So we are, we are just the beginning, but certainly uh, we are not enough to sustain the kind of growth that uh, would be required to really get a tech hub going. Uh, and I said today, I think if if they do some of these things in 10 years, uh, I think this Grand Bahama will be thought of as Silicon Island. So not a Silicon Valley, but a Silicon Island. I like that. Exactly. I like that term. <laughs> <laughs> so you said um, at the end of the year, I think it was the year you were planning on um, employing about 50 people in Grand Bahama. That's right. We'll have 50 people employed in Grand Bahama. Probably uh, five to seven will be administrative and the rest will be uh, capable of going out into the marketplace and doing the work that we do. Okay. And in a press release, you had mentioned that JIBC will invest $1 million to train Grand Bahamians in technology in the industry. Um, yes. Can you just elaborate just a little bit more on that for me, please? Yeah, so um, a lot of the training we do requires that we bring in people from our other offices. So uh, some of it is indirect cost. Uh, direct cost is is uh, hiring people, having them on payroll, and uh, not being able to deploy them while they're being trained. And I think this is uh, something that will be a sustained effort over a two- to three-year period of time. Uh, so you're looking at, at uh, uh, a significant investment, but I think... The, the important uh, aspect of this is the knowledge that we're bringing to people, and it's uh, less important the dollar amount uh, than, than what it is that we're teaching. Okay. Now, you had mentioned that you have people coming in here to train everyone and get everything going, kickstart it. At some point, do you see Bahamians going to other countries to do trainings for other uh, for clients, maybe other offices? Absolutely. In fact, one of our big clients in New York, uh, we're going to place someone there uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, for a six month period. So we're already beginning to do that. We want to uh, make sure that the, the people uh, who are working here have good opportunities and experiences to go anywhere within the company that they'd like and to give them a taste of that early on, I think is important. So right now it's just one person. Over time, it will be it will be as many people uh, as as uh, are interested. Um, we we need qualified people uh, to to go and do the work that we have, and that's uh, work that takes place in uh, it, all over the all over the world. Okay. Um, now I heard that you kind of had a three pay, three phase outline for actually rolling out here. Can yes. You tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so really, the first phase is getting things uh, established and set up with an office and a presence, uh, where we have people who are trained and, and able to go into the market. Uh, the next phase uh, was intended to be the training center, and the third phase is the data center. So, all, all things that we've touched on in our conversation, but uh, it was uh, intended to be a phased approach so that we could start to build the foundation. Uh, of people that we would need as we go. So this is something that I think will probably take uh, three to four years uh, to get through those three phases. Okay. Now, in regards to the data and AI center, can you tell us a little bit about that and like what your plans for that are? Yeah, so we, we want to create uh, a data center where uh, Bahamians uh, and, and government uh, can store information and data here on the island and not have to uh, keep those on local servers or uh, send, send their data to other places around the world to be uh, stored and maintained. So we, we think that this is uh, important once you have data that you can access and it's, it, it's easy to locate. I mean, one of the big challenges that organizations face right now they don't know what data they have or where it is, how to access it, and uh, it usually needs to be cleaned. So uh, we, we really think that there's an opportunity here uh, to begin to uh, look uh, throughout the region. And as you think about data and uh, what, what, what we will be able to do with data over the next five to 10 years, 
uh, it, it's important that uh, those capabilities are here in the region and uh, that uh, the, the information is uh, maintained and managed by local people. Okay. Now, when you start talking about data and sifting through that and whatnot, the question then for quite a number of people becomes security. Like, how yes. do you make sure this doesn't leak out? How, how do you make sure someone doesn't steal it? This, that, and the next. Do you, what do you guys have in plan for that? If you don't mind telling me. Sure. I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons that we brought on Dr. Malotra, because uh, he really is uh, the expert in that area. And we, we uh, recognize the importance of maintaining the safety of data and the privacy of data. And that's something that every organization is going to have to contend with. Uh, one of the, the European Union directives, uh, GDPR, uh, makes the, the penalties for uh, data breaches uh, quite onerous, and it can cost companies a significant amount of their uh, annual net revenue if uh, there's a data breach. There are requirements to be able to remove people's data, uh, to, to make their data portable, and uh, requirements related to uh, data breaches uh, informing uh informing their their uh, uh, the people that they collect data on so it's it's no longer a world where you can simply say sorry we've had a data breach or uh, hopefully get away with not reporting data breaches which I think happens probably uh, more often than than uh, we realize but uh, I, I think it's it's really an interesting area and as it develops uh, answering those questions will be something that every government has to contend with but it's also something that uh, every business will have to uh, either conform their practices to or hopefully uh, get ahead of and uh, do a better job at protecting people's uh, private information. I, <laughs> I do have to completely agree with that. Um, and it would be interesting to see. I, I agree with that, not only for what you're saying, but also in the fact that more than likely, a lot of information has been leaking out, and it is across private, it's across public, and most of the times, I would have to say, yeah, it just simply doesn't get out. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, forcing companies to uh, disclose that is, is probably a good idea. Um, it's it, quite challenging, though. Uh, companies, on the other hand, uh, how, how do you protect uh, people's data if uh, you're you're dealing with people who are committed to uh, to getting at the data? It could be quite difficult, but uh, I, I do think there are some things that every organization can do uh, to to uh, minimize uh, the likelihood and uh, minimize the impact of uh, of the kinds of things that we worry about. But uh, we do live in a different world than we lived in 10, 15 years ago. And we have to really begin to grapple with these difficult issues related to data. Uh, it's it's just too important to uh, make make consumers uh, who, who really don't uh, have the the bargaining power uh, compared to the organizations that collect their data to uh, to protect themselves. So, would you expect something like GDPR to come this side of the world? I, I do. I think that we will start to see things like GDPR and, and uh, where governments end up will depend, I think, on the influence that businesses have on government, the local governments. Uh, so in the U.S., for example, you may see a, a range of um, alternative uh, ways of dealing with this from state to state. Uh, it could be that the federal government comes in and, and uh, picks up uh, some of the big pieces of it, but uh, it's really hard to know at this point. I think everyone, after the uh, the Facebook breach, is a little bit more focused on it than they used to be. So uh, it's it's uh, it's just an interesting time for for those who uh, think about these issues. And uh, there there are no easy answers, but uh, we we will have to draw the line somewhere uh, in terms of who whose data who owns the data and uh, whose whose obligation it is to protect it. Now, have you, this is completely jumping to a completely different topic, but 
Have you considered at any stage selling shares to Bahamians? Uh, that's interesting. Um, I haven't specifically as it relates as it relates to Bahamians. Uh, one of the things that I've contemplated doing is uh, creating an equity option scheme for all employees, and uh, they would, uh, of course, as employees have access to that. That's something that uh, I could see us doing uh, by the end of the year, or early next year. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I am out of questions, and we're pretty much out of time at this point. But is there anything you'd like to say either about yourself or GIBC before we head off? Well, you know, maybe uh, one thing that I could touch on is, uh, you know, we, t we told you a little bit, or I told you a little bit about what we do, but I think uh, it's, it's how we do it that makes us unique. Uh, we, we really are a company focused on values. And if you come to our office in Freeport, uh, you'd, see, you'd see our values posted on the wall. And uh, those are excellence, extreme ownership, integrity, hard work, self-discipline, and determination, constant learning and improvement, and teamwork. And I really believe that everyone in the organization has to be committed to a common set of core values uh, because it really aligns our efforts and behaviors and moves us through adversity. So uh, we, we really focus on core values and we try to hire based on values, abilities, and skills in that order. Uh, so it's something that uh, I, I mention every, every chance I get because I think that kind of focus really changes uh, what an organization is able, able to produce. And one of the things uh, that I realized early on uh, or, or companies uh, and organizations haven't invested in employees in 20 years. So I would find myself asking people to produce excellent results, and I would constantly end up frustrated when those results weren't what I expected. And uh, at some point, it occurred to me that these are people who may not have seen good, much less excellent. So we had to drop, drop in what I call operating principles. And really, these are uh rules of thumb some of them are a bit philosophical but they're things like hold yourself and others accountable for achieving excellent results keep your ego in check be coachable be self-reflective welcome being challenged by others be open-minded uh use mistakes as lessons for improving and make the learning public so others can avoid making the same mistakes just uh it, it helps people start to understand the way we want them to operate and i believe that if we if we give them some guidelines uh, for how they operate, we can uh, produce different results. So it, it's been extremely useful, and I think that uh, we, we have probably somewhere between 60 and 70 right now, but they're just things that I've learned over time that uh, they, they guide how I operate and how I work, and we want to instill those in, in the people who work here because it uh, really gives people a, a clear sense of what's expected from them. To be honest, I think more companies actually need to take some of those core values, especially, and you kind of surprised me with this one, uh, extreme ownership. Um, yes. What, what, did, what do you mean by extreme ownership of, like, as a core value? So, uh, I think, um, Probably the best way to describe it is uh, when when uh, when people work here. I want them to think about the things that they would think about and do the things that they would do if they owned the company. And it's it's uh, uh, when people bring that uh, mentality to to work that uh, you can really produce some great results. And it, uh, it it changes the way people approach their work. Uh, it's actually uh, it's something that uh, I took from the title of a book, Extreme Ownership, uh, by Jocko uh, Willink. He's a, 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 a former Navy SEAL. Uh, it's a great book, by the way. So if uh, uh, it, it's uh, but but it talks about uh, extreme ownership and and what that means in some detail. But that's really what it means for me. It's it's owning and taking responsibility for producing the outcomes. It's not just doing a task doing a job it's really owning outcomes and making sure that uh 
you you are responsible for producing those outcomes and for me as as the owner i care less about how people get there uh it's it's the it's the goals that uh that uh i'm i'm really focused on and want people to achieve and uh you know so when uh if if the objective is uh to move uh x to uh a place in the other room uh and there are obstacles in the way i expect them to figure out how to overcome the obstacles not to come back to me and and uh pull me in to do the job uh it, it also has a lot i think when you think about extreme ownership communication owning communication up and down and across the organization one of the things that i've seen in in most organizations is they tend to be very siloed and communication is poor and if we have people who are thinking about how do i make sure that the people who need to know know what's going on you end up with a different place so what's your thoughts on the mentality of this is above my pay grade uh I, I think uh frankly um that's uh th that's not uh something that uh, i would expect uh, our employees to to say um that to me is an excuse uh and, and nothing more okay and that said what types of persons are you looking to hire for gibc digital in grand bahama yeah, so uh, I, the short answer to that is we're looking for people who are hungry and smart. Uh, those are the type of people that I want to work with, and those are the type of people that we can do a lot with. Um, but I have started to develop a, a, a theory that if, if you could distill uh, probably five or six things, uh, I think things like judgment, uh, hard work, uh, trustworthiness. There are a few more, but I think if you could start to identify those characteristics in people, those are the things that we really want to be able to assess and evaluate uh, when we hire people. And and it's just a handful. And I think that those things that make someone good in one, one job uh, are the same things that make someone good in another job. Now, the technical skills would be quite different, but what makes someone a good lawyer is probably the same thing or very similar to what makes someone uh, a, a good fry cook. Uh, it's, it's, but it's being able to distill those out and test for those things. I think we're going to get better employees and better results if we can do that well. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time and for coming on to the show. Thank uh, you. I know it took a little bit of time for us to actually get to this point, but, um, yeah, thank you for coming on. And by all means, if you would like to come back onto the show again, if you guys decide, you know, you want you're working on something new or you know want to talk about anything, we do feel free to let, uh, reach out and let me know. That sounds great. I'd love to. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so thanks everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care.